Okay, here we go. I won't take much time on introducing this man, Peter, who is a favorite of mine, but uh, you can go back and see the first chapter of First Peter, and you'll be able to capture some of my thoughts about this man. Okay, here we go. Second Peter chapter one. Here's what it says. Simon Peter, in the first one, it didn't say Simon, it just said Peter, but this one, he says Simon Peter, a bondservant and apostle, of Jesus Christ. And in the first uh, letter that we looked at, he said an apostle of Jesus Christ, but he didn't say a bondservant. And now he's added something here. He added Simon Peter. And Simon would have been his name before Jesus called him Peter, a rock. So now he's going back to who he started as, Simon, and then the name Jesus gave him Peter. But he says this, a bondservant. In other words, everything that I am, everything that my identity from the very beginning, uh, where I started, what Jesus named me, I am submitting myself, have submitted myself as a bond servant. A servant, a slave by choice, if we could say it like that. Simon Peter, a bond servant and apostle. I have been sent, I have been trained by the Lord Jesus, and I'm on assignment. He goes on to say, to those who have obtained like precious faith with us by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. I just love this little phrase. I've used it on occasion over the years. But it says, to those who have obtained like precious faith, like precious faith, precious faith like ours. So obviously, Peter has precious faith. He'll he'll end up being martyred. And uh, tradition tells us that when they were going to crucify him, that he requested to be crucified upside down because he wasn't worthy to be crucified like his Lord. Oh, let me tell you, from the beginning of this man's uh, time under the ministry of Jesus until the end of his life, this man's heart and passion for the Lord is impressive. You know, somebody said, well, he's the one that denied the Lord. He is the one that denied the Lord three times. However, do you remember what happened uh, when the rooster crowed after the third time? The Bible says, and Jesus looked at him. And Peter looked into the eyes of Jesus, who was over there being accused, falsely accused and abused and such. Jesus turned around and looked at Peter. And when Peter caught his eyes, it broke his heart. And the Bible says he went out and wept bitterly. Why? Why? That's the one thing he did not want to do, is to deny the Lord. He promised he wouldn't do that. And yes, he erred like we have erred. He sinned, he made mistakes like we did. But I'm telling you, you're not going to find anybody more in love with Jesus, more passionate about Jesus, more committed to Jesus than the Apostle Peter. And so he says, I'm now writing to those who have obtained like precious faith. Oh, I... I believe I've got it, and I hope I have it like him, but uh, I've said the Lord on multiple occasions as I've studied Peter, Lord, help me to capture uh, a commitment to you like Peter had. I've said the same thing about David, a man after God's own heart. Lord, help me to have a heart after yours like David did. Of course, I've said the same thing about the Apostle Paul. Lord, help me to be willing to endure suffering like Paul was able to endure suffering to fulfill my calling And of course, most of all, I say, help me to be like Jesus. So to those who have obtained like precious faith with us by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Notice he calls Jesus Christ our God and Savior. Not to put Father God down, but Jesus himself also, along with the Holy Spirit and Father God, Jesus is God. Uh, The righteousness of God our Savior of God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Verse 2, grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of Jesus our Lord. He mentioned grace and peace be multiplied in the first letter, but here he says this, grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God, in the knowledge of God. So we not only want grace and peace to Uh, Whatever level you have of grace, whatever level you have of peace to be multiplied, but also in the knowledge, whatever level of knowledge you have in the Lord, may that be multiplied uh, in the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, As his divine power has given to us 
all things that pertain to life and godliness as his divine power, divine meaning godly, his, his God, his uh, supreme, uh, his, uh, the, the being that created the universe, right? Divine, we know what divine means, as his divine godly power has what? Has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. God has given to us with his power, so, you, so nobody can stop it, everything that pertains to life and godliness. Isn't that wonderful? Through the knowledge of him who called us. It comes through him revealing these things to us through his knowledge, through his word. And he enlightens us with this knowledge, and now we've received these things. Somebody said, well, just because you know about them doesn't mean you can have them. Yes, you can if you realize that God promised them to you and he's given you authority in the name of Jesus and he will answer your prayers when you call upon him in Jesus' name. See, this is what he's saying. God has, by his divine power, given us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue, by which, now look at this, this is a famous verse and for good reason, verse four, by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature. Boy, that's a mouthful. He says, by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises. You know what promises are? Promises are not merely divine options as most believers, especially in the Western world, believe that God made these promises, but he's not committed to bring them to pass every time. Oh, no. No, that wouldn't be a promise. That's merely an option. No, these are promises. And God covenanted in the blood of Jesus to keep these promises. And Peter said, we have exceeding, exceedingly great exceedingly great and precious promises and that through these promises we may be partakers of the divine nature, God's very nature. We can partake of his nature. We can become like him in his nature. How? Through these exceedingly great and precious promises. I'm not talking about, oh, his promises to provide money for me. Yeah, but you're not going to (laughs) become... partakers of the divine nature by God just giving you money every time you ask. That's not it. There are promises in this Bible of us becoming the righteousness of God in Christ, becoming a new creation in Christ Jesus, becoming a person full of the fruit of the Spirit, a person full of the very Spirit of God. See, so these promises in the Bible are promises that lift us up from the human level all the way up to the God level. This is not us pridefully trying to exalt ourselves. Uh Uh-uh, we can never exalt ourselves like that. This is God reaching down by his power, by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and lifting us up. And well, according to what Ephesians chapter two says, And he raised us up and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Where? At the right hand of the throne of God. So, I mean, talk about powerful, uh, these promises and and how and what we can partake of, of God himself and become that because of these promises and the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. So he goes on to say now that... Uh, well, right in the middle of that, become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. We're partaking of the divine nature of God, and at the same time, we're escaping uh, the corruption that's in the world through lust. You can't, you can't do both. You can't partake of the corruption in the world while becoming part of the divine nature of God's holiness and purity and and righteousness and such. Those are two incompatible characters and natures. So he says, when you embrace God's and you partake of God's, you're also escaping the corrupt uh, world of sin and lust. Thank God we want to escape that. Okay, verse 5, but also for this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith, Virtue. Now we're going to see a number of additions here. Add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, to knowledge self control, to self control perseverance, like endurance, to perseverance 
godliness. Don't just remain faithful, but be godly, see? To godliness, brotherly kindness. Don't just be godly, be loving to people. Not godly like you're better than people, but be loving, brotherly kindness. And to brotherly kindness, love. For if these things are yours and abound, you will neither you will be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Boy, that's quite a statement. He said, if these things that I just listed are a part of your life and are doing well, abounding in your life, then you will neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, you'll see the fruit happening. You won't be barren. You're going to see the, the giving birth to the plan of God for your life, the answered prayers. You will be fruitful in your life. These promises, the knowledge of God, will be coming to pass in your life. See, if what? Let's just go look at it again. He said, if you'll add to the faith that you have, faith in Jesus, add virtue, and add to virtue, knowledge, and add to knowledge, self-control, add to self-control, perseverance or endurance, add to perseverance, godliness, to godliness, brotherly love, and to brotherly love, uh, excuse me, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, love. He said, you, you got those things? And, you know, you are going to be a fruitful person in the kingdom of God. Let me tell you, Peter knows what he's talking about, too. He's been doing this for decades now. And so he knows, and of course, he's writing by the Spirit of God. So let's look here now in verse 9. For he who lacks these things is short-sighted. In other words, you think you can get by and fulfill your calling and continue on to salvation by comp uh, and, and compromise some of these things? He said, no, he who lacks these things is short-sighted even to blindness and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your call and election sure. Be even more diligent to make your call and your election, uh, your election sure. Well, the election is the being the elect. That means it's talking about your salvation. But your call, too. Your call, the calling that you have, the ministry. He said, be even more diligent. In other words, God, yes, he's elected you to salvation. He's called you. But you need to do your part to go after the things of God and do these things that God is showing you so that the election of your salvation stays secure and the enemy doesn't get you off track and so that the call of God is fulfilled in your life. So we need to take responsibility for what God has given us so that these things will come to pass. So he said, to make your call and election sure, for if you do these things, you will never stumble. First he said, you won't be barren nor unfruitful. And now he says, if you'll do these things, you won't even stumble. You'll just keep running down the road in the things of God. You will never stumble. For, verse 11, for so an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He said, if you're walking like this as a believer, we're not talking about salvation through works. We're talking about a mature believer who's walking in these truths and the character of God and such. He said, if you'll do these things, an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 12, for this reason, I will not be negligent to remind you always of these things, though you know and are established in the present truth. So he said, because of this, because this is such a big deal, he said, I'm not going to be negligent to remind you. He said, even though you already know these things, you're, you've already been established in these things, but I'm not going to remind you. I mean, he said, I'm not going to be negligent to remind you. In other words, sometimes we, especially we teachers maybe, we're concerned about people saying, you already said that, or you're, you're, you're saying the same thing again. Like we've already heard you talk about this and emphasize this or whatever. But Peter said, I'm not going to be negligent to not remind you of these things. I'm going to keep reminding you, even if you think I'm repeating myself, because these things I'm talking about are so important and so consequential, I'm going to keep saying them to make sure that you get them. So, 
He said, I want you to be established in the present truth. Verse 13, yes, I think it is right as long as I am in this tent. And he's talking about his own physical body. As long as I'm here on earth in this physical body. He said, yes, I think it is right as long as I'm in this tent to stir you up by reminding you, knowing that shortly I must put off my tent, just as our Lord Jesus Christ showed me. And uh, you can go back to the 21st chapter of John when Jesus, toward the end of the chapter, had an exchange with Peter and said, one of these days, he said, you dress yourself and you go where you want to now, but one day you're not going to dress yourself and you're going to be carried where you don't want to go. And the Bible says he was speaking of Peter's death, how he would be martyred for the Lord. And so Peter said here, he said, as long as I'm in this tent, I'm going to remind you. He said, because it's, I'm coming close to the time when I'm going to put off this tent. This is Peter the agent. This is Peter toward the end of his life. He's coming toward the end of his ministry, and he knows it. And he says, shortly, I'm going to put off this tent. I'm, I'm leaving earth. My body's going to stay here, and I'm going to go be with the Lord. So as he's writing to them, he feels all the more uh, passionate and, and an urgency to make sure that they know and remember these things in the Lord. So he says, knowing that shortly I must put off my tent, just as the Lord Jesus Christ showed me. Moreover, I will be careful to ensure that you always have a reminder of these things after my decease. He said, not only am I going to keep reminding you while I'm here in this body, this tent, he said, but I'm going to make sure that there are other people who will continue to remind you after I'm gone. Why? I love you too much to let you be deceived, to let you be discouraged, and to not fulfill your calling and even maybe make it to heaven because you just got off track. He says, so I'm going to make sure you have reminders. Boy, this is, this is a real shepherd, isn't it? Real lover of people. Verse 14, for we did not follow, oh, here we go, for we did not follow cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the, the power and coming of our Lord Jesus, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. He's saying, I saw him with my own eyes. I saw Jesus do the miracles with my own eyes. Verse 17, for he, Jesus, received from God the Father honor and glory when such a voice came to him from the excellent glory, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And we heard this voice when we were with him on the holy mountain, the Mount of Transfiguration. Peter said, we heard the audible voice of Father God say, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. And he goes on to say, and so we have the prophetic word confirmed. And so we have the prophetic word confirmed. The King James says more certain. Um, and the NIV actually reads even a little better. But it says, Peter's saying this, look, we were eyewitnesses. We saw him with our own eyes. We were ear witnesses. We heard God from heaven speak and say, this Jesus, he's my beloved son. He said, but we have something even more sure, something confirmed. We have the prophetic word. We're talking about the scriptures. Now, of course, back in this day, they wouldn't have had the whole New Testament. They may have had some of the letters, but they wouldn't have had the whole New Testament, but they had the Old Testament, uh, the scriptures, the law, the prophets, the law of Moses, the poetic books, psalms, and such. They had all of that. And so he says, look, we've got the prophetic word confirmed, which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. So he's saying, listen, some of you may feel badly because you didn't get to walk with Jesus like I did. You didn't get to see him with your physical eyes. You didn't get to hear him with your physical ears or hear Father God speak from heaven. He said, I did. He said, but having heard all of that and seen all of that, we have something even more sure than that, something confirmed, and that is the scriptures, the word of the living God. That's why Jesus, when he was going against the devil in the wilderness, he just kept going back to the written word. It's written, it's written, it is written. Why? Because this is the more sure thing. What you see with your eyes, what you hear with your ears, you can be deceived. 
But what's written in scripture, Jesus said, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. See, this is what's solid. And Peter's saying, we got something more solid. He said, you may not have seen what I've seen, heard what I heard, but we got something more solid than that. You've got the written word of the living God. And that's solid. He goes on to say, verse 20, knowing this first, that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation, or that also means origin, for a prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. So let's just end with this now. He said, he said, we have this prophetic word confirmed, and we need to know this, that no prophecy of Scripture, none of the Scripture, none of the Word of God, no prophecy of Scripture is of a private interpretation or origin. In other words, and by the way, he's writing Scripture while he says this, but he's saying none of the biblical authors were writing from their own minds and hearts as a private perspective, a worldview. No. He said, rather, holy men of God spoke or wrote as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. In other words, these words that came through these biblical authors are rooted in the Holy Spirit who has access to all knowledge. And that means that the Holy Spirit's perspective is holistic. There's nothing he did not know. There's nothing he did not consider. No scenario in your life or my life could have altered or would have altered what he said. What he said is absolutely true, will absolutely be true forever and ever because he considered everything. He considered everything. And so that's why we can't say, well, yeah, but I mean, it said it back then, but nowadays we, we see things different and we progressed, uh-uh. No, the Holy Spirit knew what was happening today and what will happen in the next years until Jesus returns and beyond. And his knowledge of all that was all in these scriptures. It's all in there. It's all taken into consideration. And I'll tell you something else that's really exciting. Whenever we come to read or hear somebody teach on a particular passage, the Holy Spirit, when he was inspiring that passage, could not have not known that we would be reading or hearing that passage and knowing also what God needed to say to them today. So somehow, this is what one of the things that makes this such a special book. Somehow, there are embedded messages for all of us that when the Holy Spirit was inspiring these biblical authors to write, he had all of us in mind, and he knew when we were going to be hearing these passages, and he was infusing into these passages the living word for each of us. That's why the word of God is living and powerful. And so I know that we have uh, these original authors writing to original recipients, and we do need to study that in its context and such, but we have to understand, too, this comes from the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit was speaking to all of us. And so now it's up to us to let